What the hell did I just see? Holy shit, that was one of the most emotional roller coasters of sports I have ever been a part of. I am flat out out of breath and uh, just dripping with anxiety. My heart's been going a million miles an hour for the past two hours. We had WWE Money in the Bank's pay-per-view tonight going head-to-head with Game 7 of the NBA Finals and one of the greatest NBA Finals games and performances by a player and team in NBA history. That was great. And then you have a fantastic Money in the Bank pay-per-view, which may have lived up to one of the greatest of all times because of the sweet ass ending. So this is going to be a very short commentary because I actually have to leave and go out and meet some friends later. So I'm going to briefly talk about the pay-per-view right here. I will get into more detail on this tomorrow night after Monday Night Raw when I come up here and do my full review. And I'll probably talk a little bit more about the Money in the Bank pay-per-view itself along with the NBA Finals and any other opinions I might have. As far as tonight goes, let's just bring up Money in the Bank first. It literally just went off the air And I'm shocked. There are so many things about that main event that shocked me. First of all, I was having trouble focusing on it because I had just got done watching the brilliant ending of the NBA Finals, Game 7, that went all the way down to the wire. And it was just very nerve-wracking. So by the time I got my focus back on Money in the Bank, I was like, huh, I'm expecting Roman Reigns to walk out as champion and I'm basically just going to eyeball this match. But what I found myself noticing as I paid more and more attention to the match is that Roman Reigns was working heel, and that was strange. You knew something was going to happen. I was thinking double turn. I was even thinking that this would be a good place for the return of Bray Wyatt. I thought he could come out during this match and surprise everybody and attack Seth, and that could be a good way to maybe get Seth Rollins into a babyface. But instead, they go out there and have their match full of a lot of good spots. Each guy kicked out of some shit. Roman Reigns did a spear through the barricade, and the referees are kind of helping him off. And then near the end of the match, you have the great spot where Roman Reigns goes for the spear and Seth Rollins counters it into a pedigree. And I couldn't believe how magnificent that spot was. Roman Reigns kicks out, of course. Not that I'm mad about the kick out, because that's what Roman Reigns does, but I was mad that that wasn't the finish. And I started tweeting, man, that would have been a great finish if that was it. But what I wasn't expecting was for immediately following that, Seth to pick up Reigns again and hit him with a second pedigree and pin the motherfucker clean. That is the last thing in the world I expected. So that is surprise number one. And of Of course, Dean Ambrose wins the Money in the Bank earlier on in the night, which he was a favorite. It was probably down to him or Kevin Owens. I picked Kevin Owens. I kind of wanted Kevin Owens. But once Dean won, you know, I mentioned before in my past commentaries that if he won, it would probably be pretty fun to see him hold the briefcase. And for Dean Ambrose to be that briefcase holder, he has to cash it in in a very Dean Ambrose way. And once Seth Rollins is out there celebrating with the title, you're thinking to yourself, man, could could Dean come out now? I mean, Seth is spent and he's had a hard, grueling match, but he's not injured and he doesn't have a bad leg and somebody didn't beat the shit out of him and he's not bleeding and he's not unconscious. So Dean was really just taking advantage of a guy that just had a match, but Dean had a grueling match too. So I was surprised that Dean used that as his opportunity, but he went out there, cashed in the briefcase and ended up just nailing Seth with the dirty deeds and winning the fucking WWE title. I did not see that coming. I think a few people brought it up and say, hey, how cool would it be if Dean won the briefcase and then cashed it in after the Money in the Bank title match between Rollins and Reigns? I was like, yeah, that would be awesome, but I don't think it'll happen. And it fucking happened. And in one night, in one night, actually within a five-minute span, you had all three Shield members hold the WWE title. Can you fucking believe that? That's absolutely incredible. So now we have no Money in the Bank briefcase holder currently. The WWE is going to have to go a whole year without somebody holding that briefcase. I thought Dean could hang on to it because if he held on to it long enough, he would basically have two titles to choose from as as far as where he wanted to cash it in. And maybe WWE didn't want to have to tackle that issue and have to decide where to put him and what the rules are for the Money in the Bank if you can cash it in against any champion or only your brand's champion. So they took the easy way out and did the cash in before the draft even happens and Dean Ambrose is your new WWE champion. So where do you go from here? I don't know. We're going to learn a lot more tomorrow night on Monday Night Raw. SummerSlam is on the horizon, but that takes place after the draft. So the Shield might not be on the same show by the time SummerSlam rolls around. But I think a three-way match between the three of them for the WWE title is extremely likely. And unfortunately, it probably won't be able to happen at SummerSlam because it's probably going to happen at Battleground. There's really no other main event you can have. You cannot have a one-on-one match between either of those three guys. They all have a rightful claim to the title. Uh, But, well, maybe not Roman Reigns, actually, because he did get beat clean. But he's a former champion. He's got a rematch clause. So does Seth Rollins. you got to think you're going to have a shield three-way at Battleground. I think that match is big enough to go on a major pay-per-view. But 
it looks like we'll get it in July. So I could not be happier about the outcome of the main event. That was fantastic because I knew no matter what we saw, the fans were going to have something pissy to say about Seth Rollins and him not winning the WWE title and how bad Roman Reigns sucks and how he buried him and all this fucking shit. I was not wanting to have to read that shit on Twitter and hear about it on YouTube from insufferable little spoiled pricks. And I'm so happy that the main event ended the way it did because it's glorious. What a great show. When you have a main event that great, that's so full of surprises, it can really wipe away any of the not-so-great things that might have taken place on a pay-per-view. And it really made it up there with the CM Punk victory in 2011 when he ran off with the WWE title. I still think it's tough to beat that moment and that crowd in Chicago on that night back in 2011, but this one definitely came close. So congratulations to Seth Rollins for beating Roman Reigns clean and winning back the WWE title, and congratulations to Dean for successfully cashing in the briefcase and also winning the WWE title. So tomorrow night on Raw should be a lot of fun, to say the least, and I'll have a lot more to say about this situation tomorrow night. I already mentioned the Money in the Bank briefcase match. Dean Ambrose did wind up winning, which uh, I wasn't completely shocked about, but Owens, man, the promo that he cut earlier on in the night backstage was pretty funny. I mean, this guy is great. I thought he would have been a great briefcase holder, but the way things ended up, I have nothing to complain about. I'm happy Dean won, and I love the fact that he cashed in that briefcase. The other major, major, major match on Money in the Bank was AJ Styles versus John Cena. John Cena's first match back. Now, John Cena lost the last match that he wrestled back in October, and then he lost his return match to AJ Styles. AJ did beat him, which I predicted and I was hoping he would. It was signed, of course, to be a one-on-one match between AJ and Cena, and they put on a really good match. I mean, Cena, he hasn't been in the ring since October, and other than a little, uh, just a few signs of ring rust, I thought Cena and AJ wrestled a really good match. These guys have never worked together, and Cena hasn't been in the ring in seven months. So the fact that these guys still put on a pretty damn good match with a lot of good spots, a lot of good moves, a lot of this is awesome chants, a lot of drama, um, I was happy with it overall. The finish... I really have no problem with because a couple of reasons. Number one, AJ is a heel, and heels are going to cheat. He found a way to cheat because the referee got knocked down. And what I did like about the finish, uh, you know, a lot of people were complaining that it was anticlimactic, but if John Cena would have kicked out of that then people would have been bitching. So Gallows and Anderson interfere while the referee is knocked out, nail John Cena with their finisher, and AJ pins him. One, two, three. And a lot of people were like, whoa, I'm surprised. Cena didn't kick out. The super Cena that we all know uh, would have easily kicked out of that move by Anderson and Gallows. So maybe perhaps John Cena's age is showing, and he's slowing down. Now, his feud with AJ Styles obviously is not over, so a lot of fans are probably going to be pissed off next month when John Cena gets his victory back or whatever the fuck. And then if they wrestle a third time, you know, at SummerSlam, that's going to be the blow-off, and uh, Cena might most likely win that again. Uh, What I would like to see them do is separate them. Let them each have a victory against each other and then separate them on the rosters, and then maybe bring them back together again a year from now, or maybe WrestleMania or something like that. That could be pretty fun. But regardless, we have not seen the last of the AJ and Cena feud. I'm sure it will be furthered tomorrow night on Monday Night Raw, and uh, we'll go from there. But expect some sort of a battleground match. I'm sure it's going to be a stipulation involved. A Gallows and Anderson barred from ringside cage match, Hell in the Cell, some shit like that, I'm sure. So uh, expect something like that. And this feud is far from over, but as far as tonight goes, I'm glad AJ got the victory, a much-needed victory over a major WWE star. The main card was packed. My predictions were all over the place. I think I got four matches right, four matches wrong, or whatever. But they had all eight matches that I predicted on the main card. And they added two kickoff show matches. The kickoff show was Golden Truth beating Breezango and the Lucha Dragons beating the Dudley Boys. The undercard of Money in the Bank saw Charlotte and Dana Brooke getting the victory over Natty and Becky in the tag team match. And then they threw a swerve and surprise at us, turning Natty heel, which I liked. She is long overdue for a heel turn, and she needs it. There's nowhere left for her to go. So her being frustrated that they lost and her attacking Becky, it seems like everybody attacks Becky. Uh, But Natalia is now heel and I'm fine with that. In a match that I predicted wrong, which I figured I would because it was a long shot, Titus O'Neil did lose to Rusev. Rusev beat him, continued his hot streak, continued rolling on, and then cut a promo after the match on Titus O'Neil's kids who were like in the front row. That was great. I had to go back and take a, a quick sneak peek at that because that match took place during the fourth quarter of Cleveland and Golden State. So my eyes were glued to the TV. 
Apollo Crews did beat Sheamus. I kind of predicted Sheamus to win this first encounter. I didn't really like the finish because Sheamus nailed Crews with a sick-ass white noise. I mean, really scary-looking finisher from the second rope. And Crews kicked out, and then while Sheamus is bitching at the referee about the two-count, Crews rolls him up into a crucifix and pins him. So I wasn't a huge fan of that, uh, but it, it was what it was, and Crews was victorious. Dolph Ziggler and Baron Corbin had a pretty decent match as well. Uh, there was even a botch in there that uh, was saved by Corbin. Uh, Ziggler Ziggler kind of tripped over the steps, and Corbin still caught him and spun him into one of his signature moves out there on the concrete, which was good. Loved Ziggler's outfit. Man, when he's in that ring, he is so reminiscent of Shawn Michaels, and when he was wearing those uh, blue tights, it really reminded me of Shawn, the the set of blue tights he would wear in like 1996, 1997, and uh, just eerie seeing him like that. He looks so much like him, but pretty good match, and hopefully this is finally the end of Corbin and Dolph Ziggler. What else am I missing? I think the uh, tag title match, right? The Fatal 4-Way, New Day did retain, as expected. I want Gallows and Anderson to win those tag team titles. I think that they will. Uh, I just want them to do that in a one-on-one encounter. I think tomorrow night on Monday Night Raw might be a good place for that because WWE is on a roll right now. Everybody is so excited about the outcome of the main event. AJ Styles got a big win over John Cena. You should keep the momentum going and have a title change tomorrow night on Raw. If not, let New Day break whatever tag team title record you want them to break first and then have them drop it to Gallows and Anderson, but fucking do it soon. All in all, very little to complain about about this pay-per-view. I mean, it definitely wasn't perfect by any means, and there was a few dead spots and dull moments and shit like that, like there is at every pay-per-view. But overall, you know, when I come away from the pay-per-view and it's all over, I'm completely out of breath because I loved what I saw. And, of course, I had the combination thing going on with the NBA Finals because I was just so intrigued by that game. I mean, LeBron James in one game has the chance to silence every critic he's ever had. The team with the greatest record in NBA history had a 3-1 to one lead on him, and he won the final three games, including two inside of Golden State, who had only lost like one game there all year. And everybody says that he doesn't come through in clutch moments. Nobody was more clutch than LeBron. I am so unbelievably impressed. I picked Golden State all year. I love them. I think they're a fantastic team. They're so exciting to watch. They have like a new offense. They're hitting threes, you know, and it's just something different. I mean, they're like the AJ Styles of the NBA. I mean, they're so entertaining, and I thought for sure they were going to play right through Cleveland and the fact that they imploded like that such a good team that keeps it together and keeps their cool and has done such a good job of dominating every team for the past two years with the MVP you know playing at such a high level I didn't see Cleveland who went through a coaching change in the beginning of the year or in the middle of the year uh, to even have a chance against them and Cleveland was able to win it and close it out on the road in game seven you have to appreciate how incredibly rare that is for a home team to lose a game seven especially in the NBA finals so uh, LeBron was the fucking man and I'm absolutely thrilled for Cleveland and him because I think it's something that his legacy needed because people have been all up his ass. It doesn't matter now. He silenced everybody in one game. Actually in three games because he was brilliant in game five, six, and seven. So that was a fantastic series. If it can be like that every year, I'll be completely happy. And it has nothing to do with my love for LeBron or Cleveland. I don't give a shit about Cleveland, trust me. And I hate the owner, Dan Gilbert. I think he's a fucking asshole. But, uh, and I would have been perfectly happy with the Warriors winning because I love that team. But what Cleveland did, you cannot deny how great they played. And Kyrie Irving, too, unbelievable. I think two plays are going to live in infamy in that game seven. Number one was the sick-ass block LeBron James had on Iguodala with about a minute left, and I think the game was tied. And then Kyrie hit a three-pointer with just a few seconds left to give them the lead, and, uh, you know, there was no looking back. So that was pretty unbelievable shit. Congratulations to the Cleveland Cavaliers, and uh, that was a very fun and entertaining NBA playoffs and finals. So that is it for me. I will get out of here. I will talk more about Money in the Bank tomorrow night. I'll go into a detailed review of Monday Night Raw as well and touch on any other uh, news tidbits there might be. I know Jerry Lawler did have an incident with his 12-year-old girlfriend over the weekend. I know Lawler doesn't drink and he's, you know, pretty much, uh, you know, straight as an arrow, but he gets himself involved with these young girls and I think she was drunk and there was a domestic incident and he got arrested and he's suspended indefinitely from the WWE until this gets sorted out. Um, And I know Jerry Lawler is not a bad person. I don't think he'd ever hit a woman or anything like that. But when he gets in these relationships, he just he he's just goes from one dysfunctional relationship to another. He's been doing that his whole life, and shit like this happens to him. So I hope that it works itself out for him, and he's able to come back to the WWE. But he's just so fucking immature for somebody who's like 70 years old. 
I couldn't imagine being that age and dating somebody that was in high school in 2008. That's insane. So we'll see how things play out with Lawler, and I'll talk more about that in the future. And I'll also talk about how uh, WWE, apparently, according to the internet reports, has been contacting a lot of former stars, including some veterans, to come take part in this brand split. So that's a juicy story that's bubbling as well. So you guys have a great rest of your night. Follow me on Twitter, at GoodMikeWork, and live tweet with me tomorrow night during Monday Night Raw. I will be up giving my thoughts during the whole show. And then after the show, I will be up, like I said, with a full review of Monday Night Raw, a preview to Battleground, and some more thoughts on Money in the Bank. So have a good rest of your night. Leave me all your comments, thoughts, and opinions on Money in the Bank in the comments below. And I will catch you in about 24 hours. Until then, peace.